This morning's message, uh, we're going to continue off in what we've been doing, but it's adapted from a message by Reverend David Kruger, and I want us to just consider how we, as we approach Christmas, as we anticipate Christmas Day, a day that memorializes the coming of Jesus Christ, his arrival, when he came years ago, we also celebrate what Jesus brings with him. Last week, we We're looking at how Jesus also brought, when he arrived, he brought hope. He brought hope to shepherds. And that hope is an everlasting legacy that we have today that still is bringing to us, is still affecting us today. And so today we're going to begin, and I have a question for you. How many of you have heard of Giving Tuesday? Let me see some hands. Giving Tuesday. All right, some of you have. The Tuesday right after Thanksgiving is the day after what we call Cyber Monday, right? There's Black Friday on Friday after Thanksgiving. There is Cyber Monday on Monday after Thanksgiving. And then there is Giving Tuesday, just a couple days after the holiday break. And it started back in 2011. It was the brainchild of a nonprofit, Mary Archie Theater Company, and they were urging their donors to take a different approach to filling their virtual carts. They wanted to encourage donations, giving philanthropy. And so Given Tuesday since then has become a movement to create an international day, not just here in the US, but an international day of charitable giving at the beginning of the holiday season. And I think it's a great idea, especially in light of how commercialized Christmas has become nowadays, amen? But let me just tell you, I'm going to be honest with you, okay? This last Tuesday, I think that every single email in my inbox had a reference to Giving Tuesday. Every single one of them. Missionaries, organizations that I'm a member of, and even businesses, like people that I've gone and I've purchased something there at their store, they all started emailing and they were reaching out to me, reaching out saying, You know what? If you've never supported us before, if you've never bought into our brand before, then today is the opportunity. It's Giving Tuesday. And hey, I know you've been here with me before, but you know what? Can we, can we kick it up a notch? Can, can you show even greater commitment and support to everything that we do, everything we stand for? And so I think that my inbox was saturated. It was there. It was all over the place. And you know what? As I sat there saving some emails... And deleting a few others, the thought came into my mind, Lord, unfortunately, I cannot embrace every single cause. And that's how I felt. And maybe some of you got those emails as well. Some of us didn't even read them. We got those emails, and at the sight of the word give, we smashed that delete button faster than a dog can lick a dish. Gone. All right? And I can see how fast those dogs are, man. It's like you blink your eyes, the food's gone. Careful. The truth is that some of us are are, are experiencing what sociologists call compassion fatigue. So many people today are just tired of constantly helping, tired of always seeing others in needs, and we're tired of repeatedly being asked to help. As Christians, we're not immune to this. Okay, let me just take the weight off your shoulders, the stigma off. We're not immune. That's why the Apostle Paul says, do not grow weary in well-doing, right? Because if you continue in due season, you will reap a harvest. We have to be reminded because we're not immune to this. If we're honest, we get tired of constant ministry towards others. We get tired. And so it reminds me of a story I once heard. There's a fable about a village that fell on hard times. And in order to provide for the most desperate among them, the village elder decided to take some action. And so he made a decision and he decreed it to the entire village that every family immediately, not someday, not next week, next month, immediately, by tonight, every single family within the village needed to make a donation to the public storehouse. And what was the most needed in that village was milk. So he said, by this evening, every family needs to bring one bucket of milk and deposit in the storehouse. 
And so families donated all night long. They came in and the village elder was just watching them as they come through with their buckets and he's excited and he's like, wow, the community is really pulling together. And so the next day when the elder came in to check all the donations in the storage tank, he took a look and it was full. To his amazement, it was full, full of water. See, every single person within that village had the same logic. They said, you know what? No one's going to notice my little bucket. So what's the sense of me putting milk? Let me just put some water instead. Unfortunately, that entire village that day failed. It failed because not one of them was moved to help. Not one of them was moved to love their neighbor. As we anticipate Christmas and the Christmas season, the arrival of Jesus, we also anticipate another arrival, another package that's deposited, that's dropped off, special delivery, and that is the arrival of true love. The arrival of love is crucial. Turn in your Bibles with me to John's Gospel, and I, maybe you don't even have to turn there because this is one of the most well-known verses in all the world. And let me tell you about a love that the Apostle describes as giving everything it has. A love, the kind of which holds nothing back. This morning, I want to share with you lessons of this kind of love. And the first scripture we're going to look at, we're going to look at a couple in John, but the first one is John 3, 16. How many of you can just quote that back to me? Let's do it together. Ready? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. See, the first thing I want us to understand as we look at the arrival of love this Christmas season is that true love encourages us to give ourselves to others. See, God is our supreme example of true love that gives selflessly. Not selfishly, selflessly. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. See, God gave us what we needed most. Turn to your neighbor, what you needed most. What I needed most. Himself. He gave us himself. See, God established the covenant with Abraham. But he knew that when he established that covenant with Abraham, that we were going to need something more. It wasn't enough. See, God came and he gave the law to Moses on Mount Sinai. He gave it to him twice because he broke the tablets in a fit of rage and anger at the disobedience of the people. And even though Moses had the law the second time, God gave it to him. He says, I know this is not enough. See, God gave not only the law, but he came and he gave the ritual sacrifices to the Levites. He gave the order of of, of service, the order of sacrifice, the order of feasts and all these different things to celebrate, to memorialize, to remember and give glory to him. But yet God realized it's not enough. See, God then beyond that, beyond the covenant, the law and the sacrifices, God gave the people something for generations. He gave them the prophets the prophets to speak out his name, to decree his words, and to live and abide in his law and show the people the way, to speak for God. He gave them the prophets, but he knew that that wasn't enough. But then Galatians 4.4 tells us, in the fullness of time, God sent his only son. In the fullness of time, in just the right time, God gave us exactly what we needed most, his very own presence. His very presence. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, but though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 5, 6 through 8. See, God loves you, loves me so much that he invested his own life in ours by becoming one of us in the form of his son, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Savior, the one who would come to redeem his people. God gave us something that we needed the most, himself. 
He didn't say, I'm going to send an intermediary. I'm going to send a substitute. I'm going to send a program, send a, 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 a package, a, you know, a bailout plan. I'm not going to send any of these things, but I'm sending my very self in the form of my son. And we need to be willing to offer what is needed most in today's age and society. When we look around us at the needs in our corners, in our spheres of influence, in our workplaces, in our communities, in our families, we need to be willing to offer what is needed most ourselves. We cannot, we must not be like the villagers who said, my little bucket is insufficient. It will make no difference. We can't live hoping that someone else, somewhere else, will deal with the problems, the needs, the issues in the lives of the people around us. True love for God and true love for man demands nothing less than engaging personally. Can you say that personally? Engaging per personal involvement is the only way we're going to make a difference in the world that we live in. The only way. The question is, will we give our church, will we give our community what it needs most, ourselves? Will we step up and step into the fight? Our attention, our hands, our resources, our skills, our abilities, our time, our resources, whatever it might be, will we say, here we go, Lord. Here I am, Jesus. See, lots of Christians do nothing for either their church or their community. But let me get this in your heart and in your spirit this morning. There are no Christians who have nothing to do, though. Many do nothing, but there is no Christian, there is no definition, there is no room for a Christian that has nothing to do. Because Jesus says, you are it. I go to the Father to prepare a place for you. You are my hope. You are my master plan of evangelism. You are my master plan to reach and to connect this world. And upon you, upon this foundation of you, my disciples, I shall build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Lots of Christians do nothing either for their church or their community, but there are no Christians who have nothing to do. True love encourages us to give of ourselves to others. Not only were we given his presence, his very presence when he came and he abided in that babe in Jerusalem. Emmanuel, God with us, but God through Jesus, through his great personal effort. What did he do? If we look at his life, not only did he come as a baby and he grew up and we can marvel at him and say, Google got a guy and like, like my little baby son, I just, I marveled every time I look at him and I'm just excited to look at him. But Jesus didn't come just to be looked at. While he came through great effort of his own, what did he do? He taught the people about the kingdom of God. He healed the sick. He brought ministry to the afflicted and he cast out demons. He did all these things to the point of exhaustion at times. At times when he saw the crowds, he looked at them with compassion. He just said, I'm going to serve. I'm going to give of myself. And eventually at times we see him where he tries to sneak away because he is exhausted. He needs that time with his father. He needs that time with his disciples. He needs that time to recover and recuperate and re-strategize and go out and accomplish more. But he did that to his own great effort, his own involvement. Ultimately, if we look at his life as our example, not only did he give, did he teach, did he heal, did he minister, but ultimately, he poured out his life's blood as a sacrifice for our sin. That we might know true forgiveness and what it means to have a relationship of redemption with God, the Father. And that demonstrates this. That true love always gives regardless of personal cost. Regardless. True love is never cheap. It always is going to cost something. For Jesus, it was the ultimate price. A price he was all too willing to pay because he said this in John 15, 13. He says, greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. Assemblies of God missionary, J.W. Tucker. For him, it was a very similar price, a very similar cost. See, Tucker knew that he was at risk when... Anarchy broke out in the Belgian Congo in 1964. 
But although anarchy is happening in the country where he's ministering, where he's felt the call of God to come and to minister, to be the man of God there, to stand in the gap for a people, he knew anarchy was all around him, yet he says, I will stay where God has placed me. And one day a mob attacked him and they killed him. They killed him with sticks, clubs, fists, and broken bottles, and they beat him to death. They took his body, then they threw it back in the back of a truck. Then when they drove off a little while, they took his body and tossed his corpse to the crocodiles in the Bomokande River. And in that place, which is now considered the Democratic Republic of Congo, that was his final resting place. That river, in such a brutal and gruesome way. Well, J.W. Tucker had risked everything Yet he seemingly had very little to show for his efforts. But 30 years later, John Weidman, a close friend of Tucker, was in the country. By then, the country was known as Zaire. And he learned how God had used the missionary's sacrifice 30 years later. See, the Bomokande River flows through the middle of the Mangbido tribe, a people virtually without the gospel, remote, You say the name of Jesus, they're like, who's that? What is that? What language are you speaking? During a civil war, the Mangbido king appealed to the government, to the central government in Kinshasa. They asked, we need help. Send somebody. The government sent a brigadier, a military man, a policeman of strong stature and reputation who came from Isiro. Tucker had led brigadier to the Lord. Just two months, think about this, two months before he died, he led this man to the Lord. And as a new Christian, this brigadier had done his best to witness to others, but he had very little, very little results, very little response. People weren't accepting the message. Then one day he heard of the Mangbido tribe tradition that said, if the blood of any man flows in the Bomokande River, you must listen to his message. The brigadier called for the king and the villager elders, and they gathered in a full assembly to hear the brigadier say this. Some time ago, a man was killed, and his body was thrown into your Bomokande River. The crocodiles in the river, they came and ate him up. His blood flowed in your river. But before he died, he left a message. This message concerns God concerns God's son who was sent on earth. His name is the Lord Jesus Christ. He came to this world to save people who were sinners. He died for the sins of the world. He died for my sins. I have received this message, and this message has changed my life. And as the brigadier preached... The Spirit of God descended on that tribe. And people began to fall on their knees and cry out to the Lord. And they asked, what must we do to be saved? And many people that day were converted. Many people that day said, I will put my faith in Jesus Christ. And since that day, thousands of Mangbidos have come to Christ. And dozens of Assemblies of God churches have opened up in that region. Praise God. Give glory to Jesus Christ. See, true love gives regardless of personal cost. I pray that if God requires this of me, I really do. I wrestle with this, and I I pray to God, and I say, Lord, I live in America. I can speak the name of Jesus wherever I go. I can declare his name, and I wear a cross on my chain, and I do all these things, but it's very easy The most that I'll ever have is someone saying, oh, you're a weirdo, you're a Jesus freak. Really, like, if you stop and think about that, there's there's no persecution here. Go tell somebody like Tucker about persecution because he knows what that is. But I think, I pray, I'm like, Lord, if this is ever required of me, if this is the cost that you're asking me to pay, like you asked Tucker, like you asked Diedrich Bonhoeffer, like you asked so many of the martyrs of history, of Christian church history. Lord, I pray that I meet this request, that I meet this bill, and I pay the cost with graceful devotion like these men and women of faith. I pray that that's my portion, Jesus. But the reality is, church, if we can be honest, 
The majority of us will never be asked to pay such a price. The majority of us. We have to stand up for faith, be willing, be desiring to do so. But most of us will never have to give our actual life's blood for the gospel. Therefore, my question is simple. What's the holdup? What's the holdup? Why are we, the Christians, who are not doing anything for the church or our community? If this will never be required of us, why do we still hold and wait? There is so little that the cost has come to be for us. Then why not get involved? Why not throw our hats in the rink and say, I get into the arena and I am fighting for the cause. I am stepping in, Jesus. Here I am. Use me. How have we inflated the cost of personal involvement, denying love for our fellow man? It's a question that I wrestle with. Is it really too much to do? Is it really too inconvenient to share with the person in front of me at the grocery line that Jesus Christ is here for them? To speak a word of encouragement, to pray for those who are in need, not say, I'll pray for you, brother, but right then, stop in that moment. What is the cost, really? A few minutes? An activity that we might be late for? But we just missed the opportunity, the divine appointment, and we were late for that one because we failed to pray. Whatever it is, let's not inflate the cost of personal involvement. Here's the second lesson of Jesus' arrival, of the love that comes when he shows up. It teaches us this, that true love encourages us to be an example of humble servants. That's what it is. Jesus was willing to be a humble servant. He says, I put my life on the line. No greater love is this. But he said, I am setting before you an example. You should do as I have done for you, John 3, uh, 13, 15. This scripture, if you go to chapter 13, it comes to us around a story. It was the night that Jesus was to be betrayed. He was betrayed, and they were celebrating the Passover meal, and at that meal, he decides to do something unexpected, but very in line with this character. It was exactly who Jesus was. He took off his robes, he wrapped a towel around his waist, and then he took a basin of water and a towel, and one by one he started washing the feet of his disciples. He started cleaning the dust and the grime and the nastiness off of their feet. And we pick up the story in in verse 12. So look with me, chapter 13, verse 12. So when he had washed their feet and taken his garments and reclined at the table again, he said to them, Do you know what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for I am. If I then, the Lord and teacher, wash your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I gave you an example that you also should do as I did to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, you are blessed if you do them. Jesus told his disciples, I have set for you an example to follow. And then he adds his own personal commentary. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Sometimes we have all the answers. It's like talking to teenagers. You tell them something of correction or discipline you're trying to share. I I can say that because I've been there, guys. We say, I know, right? I know. Yeah, I know. Another way, it's, yeah, just, just uh, okay, let me do it when I want to do it and, and stop talking to me so I know I'll appease you, all right? None of our teenagers here do that. That's just teenagers, you know, in another church, okay? So, I know. Jesus says, if you know these things, it's not, it's not good enough to just know them. It's important for us to do them. To know something, to have knowledge is not the power, it's applied knowledge that's power. Applied knowledge, knowledge in action, that's wisdom, right? He's not talking about actually washing people's feet here. Because otherwise we would have a feet washing party every Sunday and we would try to go out in the world, we'd set up buckets at every corner, be like, let me wash your feet because I'm fulfilling the commandments of Jesus Christ. I'm following after his example, Um, I don't think we'd reach a lot of people. There's some folks that are very, very private in particular about their feet. 
It's ticklish. It's, it's, it's off limits. You, you no, know, you're not going to touch this. You're not going to deal with it. Jesus is not talking about us literally washing feet. But what he's talking about, what he wants us to understand, the example he set before us is that we must have the attitude. The attitude required to perform such a lowly act. I want to just thank Andy. Are you here, Andy? Andy, thank you so much for your servant heart. On Black Friday, this man was here. And for four hours, he was rotor rootering a, a clog in Little Lamb. And I thank you that you took off of your holiday, your time, and you didn't care what was happening or what was the prize or what was the compensation. You said, here I am, let me help out. I thank you for that. Can you all give it up for him? That water was disgusting. It smelled horribly. And it was gross. And we had some fun that day, didn't we? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Do not, please, throw any wipes in the toilets. Can I just ask you all together as saints of God who are, who are on fire and committed, in this building we have a septic system and we cannot afford to have any wipes, even though it says on the bottle, in the, in the package, it's disposable, it dissolves, it does not, okay? And if you have any questions, ask Andy. And ask our rotor ruler bill and the equipment we rented and the time we spent. So thank you so much for throwing it in the trash. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. I have a group of people who are fired up. Amen. See, the most important evidence of our relationship with Christ is our willingness to sacrifice ourselves for those around us. Christianity was not meant to be a hidden relationship a hidden reality in our lives. Christianity is something that's meant to be seen. There can be so much, there can't be so much as a thing. It doesn't exist an undercover disciple. There is no undercover disciples, all right? Because either the secrecy will destroy the discipleship or the discipleship with God, the relationship with him will destroy the secrecy in our lives. There is no undercover discipleship. Christianity is meant to be seen. We model what we believe when we're living it and abiding by it and others can see the example that Jesus Christ has set because we're following after that example, amen? And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Our Lord's example of love was a revolutionary one. It was changing. It flew in the face of everything that was happening around them. You're supposed to be our Messiah, the king that we are awaiting. You are the son of God. What are you doing on the ground? Why are you touching my feet? What's going on? It was revolutionary because he left heaven. He came, and Jesus came, and he said, I'm not just here to do this unto you because you're my fellow Jew. No, he washed the feet of tax collectors. Matthew was a tax collector, also known as Levi, right? He did so for the prostitutes. He did so for those of questionable character. Jesus was loving to every single person. He did not dismiss a single one, a single place. That's why when John says, for God so loved the world, it was for all classes, for all people, for all demographics, for all social economic situations and classes. It was for every single person on earth. The example of Jesus shows us that God's love for us is unconditional. Unconditional. And this is how we must love others, unconditionally. Christians or non-Christians, friends or enemies, we love unconditionally. The minute that we place a condition upon our love for someone else, we immediately step away from the love that God brought when he arrived. We step into a man-made love, a substitute, something that just pales in comparison. But the moment that we say, I have no conditions, I will love you no matter what, that is when we step into the love of God, the love that God intended for our world, for us to emulate and model. The real test of our faith comes when we give of our time, our efforts, and our resources, even to the stranger, even to our enemies. In 1928, a very interesting case came before the courts in the state of Massachusetts. It concerned a man who had been walking on a boat dock, just going about his day, checking out some boats, and he was hanging out. His friends were a little bit far away, but he was just taking a stroll. And this man accidentally tripped over a rope, and he fell into the water. He fell into the ocean. 
and the waters were deep. And as he fell there, this man started to sputter. He started to drown. He started to freak out. And in a panic, he's bobbing up and down. He's yelled out. As he's screaming out for help, he sank again, obviously in trouble. His friends were too far away. They couldn't hear him. So they couldn't come to aid him and help him out. But right there on the other dock, on the deck, sprawled out, sun tanning, was another man, a young man. This young man is sun tanning and receiving all these wonderful vitamins from the sun, getting his tan going, preparing for, you know, the summer, whatever it is. He hears the man screaming out, this man can swim, this man can do something. He hears the man sing, help, I cannot swim. But the sun tanner only turned his head, watched as the man floundered up and down in the water. He saw him sink for one last time and disappear into the bay. The family of this man who drowned was so moved and so furious at the, at the lack of compassion that this sunbather had, that he would not do a single thing that they said, we're suing you, and they took him to court. And in court, they're going through this legal battle. And unfortunately, the court ruled at the very end of it all that the man on the dock had no legal responsibility whatsoever to try to save another man's life. In effect, the man was perfectly okay, perfectly fine. He had every legal right to stay in his lane, to stay in his zone, to not get involved, to not say a thing. And he was okay in doing that. He was okay for not becoming involved. I thank God that the laws have changed. Let, let me just tell you, in Massachusetts and 10 other states in the country of the United States of America, there is such a law as a duty to rescue law. There's also the Good Samaritan laws that protects those who do get involved. But regardless of the legal code, I want you to understand this. That we as Christians... Cannot be like Abel, or I'm sorry, like Cain, who says, I am not my brother's keeper. And say, I'm not getting involved. I don't need to be interested in what happens to the wolves around me. I have every legal right. Well, no, you don't. Because you're a citizen not of this kingdom. Even if the laws were not there, you're a citizen of God's kingdom. And in his kingdom, it says that there is no Christian that has nothing to do. Every Christian has a right and a responsibility to reach out, to connect, to love, to share, because Jesus Christ has set an example. Go ahead and give God a praise for that. That praise right there is us doing some surgery in our hearts and saying, Lord, I receive it. Amen. It's just giving us an amen to what God is calling us to do. The moment we withhold our love for someone because of that person's words, because of that person's you know, background, origin of, uh, 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 you know, origin story, their looks, their personality, their actions, their failures, their disappointments. The minute we withhold our love, no matter how ugly or cruel that person has been to us or how unknown they are to us, we've placed a condition upon them. We've played, placed a condition upon the love that we have for that person. And that's not what God called us to. True love encourages us to be an example of a humble servant that takes on the attitude, whatever you need, I'm here for you. I will help you. I will minister to you. I will put your needs before my own. Third lesson that I see in, in, as we prepare for the arrival of Jesus, the arrival of love, is that true love encourages us to tell others about our Jesus. See, the brigadier who heard of the Mangbito tribe, this man said, I have received this message and it has changed my life. It's very similar with the woman that we find in, in the book of John chapter 4. The Samaritan woman who says, I have heard, he has told me things about my life and he has changed me in that encounter. She shared her message with everyone around her. See, one day while Jesus was on a journey, his disciples came to a well on the side of a road. He sent his disciples to go get food. I trust you know the story in John chapter 4. While he was there, a woman of very questionable character, a woman who was not married once, twice, but four different times and living with somebody else that was not her husband, she came to the well at the inopportune time. But let me remind you, like we said last week, Jesus has a way of showing up at the odd times in unnatural ways. He showed up in this woman's life at that moment at a well when no one else is there. 
And while there, they start a conversation, a dialogue. She starts drawing water. She's coming to receive that which she needs. And Jesus asks this lady, he looks at her as she pulls out that bucket of water. Lady, can you give me a drink? Lady, fill me up. Lady, I need to drink something. And they get into a chat. They start discussing doctrine and theology. But Jesus tells her, very simply, as he looks at the ladle of water that she's drawn, he looks at her and says, everyone who drinks this water that you have will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water that I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I give will become in them a spring of water welling up for eternal life. Jesus himself, church, we, we studied the I am statements. He is the wellspring of life. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the bread of the world. He is the light of the world. He is all these different things. He's the water that is refreshing. The water that he is referring to is he himself. Why? Because true love encourages us to give of ourselves. He gave of himself. The Bible calls the spiritual satisfaction that we will receive when we take this water that Jesus offers. The Bible refers to it as being born again, as being saved. It's sometimes we throw around Christianese. I'm saved. Are you saved? Uh, saved from what? What are you talking about? From paying taxes on the 15th? What, what are you talking about, right? Being saved. That means that we've received the spiritual satisfaction from Jesus. We've been set free. We are new creations in Christ. And that day at the well, on the side of that dusty road, this woman got saved. This woman was set free. This woman tasted of the refreshing waters that Jesus Christ offers. So because she received it, what does she do? She goes home, she puts it in her journal. She goes home, she writes a letter to her mom, and she says, I had a great day today. I'll tell you about it someday. No, she goes home, and she starts meeting every single person within her society. She's the woman that went to the well at a time that no one else was there because she didn't want the ugly stares, the accusation, the stigma of the people around her because she's a woman of unquestionable character. She didn't care about that at that point because you know what? True love gives no matter the personal cost. You're going to accuse me. You're going to have stigmas against me. You're going to have your own perceptions of me. I don't care about that. Let me just tell you what I received. I received something. I met a man. He started telling me about, his, about my life. I met a man. He told me everything I've done. He read my mail. And this man started giving me something that I never experienced before. And I am changed. I am forever new. I am a completely new creation. So let me tell you about the message that I have received. And that day an entire village of Samaritans. That day, salvation came to a place that no one else wanted to go. And the people say in verse 42, if you read the whole story, they say this. Not only did they hear her message and put faith in it, but then they stepped out to see Jesus. They say, we no longer believe just because of what you said. See, we're gonna share Jesus Christ with people. We're gonna defend the gospel and bring it to folks. We're doing our part, and God will honor that. His Spirit will come, he'll move, he'll move upon people's hearts and minds, and it's the Holy Spirit that brings conviction, that changes our hearts. We are fishers of men, not cleaners of men. God comes, and he does that work, but then he shows up. He starts ministering to people's lives, and it's no longer just what you've said, it's the experience that they now have in Christ. We're the ones who facilitate this process. We're the ones that make this possible. And so Jesus came to give eternal life to all those who would come to him. This woman came, this woman came to him, and she received from him. Those in the Samaritan village came to him and received him. Those in the Mangbito tribe, in the middle of that place where a missionary had died, they came to Jesus, and Jesus gave them life. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my words and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment but have passed from death into life. And this is the will of him who sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. Those are the Apostle John's words. In these verses, if these verses are true, there is life here. If these verses are true, how dare we have the audacity, the boldness, the courage to proclaim that we love others while we do not share his words? 
If this is true, we cannot afford church. Friends, we cannot afford, I cannot afford to say I've received this love, but I can't share it. It's not possible. Pastor Bill Wilson shared in his book, the the worship team can come up, very simple. Three ideas, three truths that I want you to, to hold on to this morning. Pastor Bill Wilson wrote in his book, Streets of Pain, about a story real life story, nonfiction, what really happened. And this is, is, I want you just to understand, not every single one of us will change or stand before millions with the gospel of Jesus. Some of us are called to stand with just our coworkers and our fam, friends and family. And that's the platform that God will give us. That's amen, praise God. That's our commission, we receive it. But let me just show you what Pastor Bill Wilson shared in his book about a man named Edward Kimball. Look at how powerful one person's witness can be. Edward Kimball was a shoe store assistant, not a preacher, not an evangelist, not an apostle, not a man with many titles. He was a shoe store assistant, not even the owner of the store, but the assistant. But he was also a Sunday school teacher in Chicago. And Edward Kimball, he spent hours of his free time watching Netflix. No, just kidding. There was no Netflix. He spent hours of his time playing video games. No, he didn't have that. He spent hours of his time dissecting all the stats of every sport and every, every athlete. No. Not that those things are wrong. We can do those things in moderation. But look at this. He spent hours of his free time visiting the young street urchins in Chicago's inner city. And this was his hope, his purpose, trying to win them over for Christ. Hours of his free time. Through him, a young boy named D.L. Moody got saved in 1858. Moody grew up to be a preacher. Moody had some impact here in Boston. He was a powerful man of God. In 1879, Moody, while preaching, won over F.B. Mayer to the Lord. Mayer became a preacher. And Mayer, in his preaching and his faithfulness to God, he won J.W. Chapman to Christ. Chapman became a preacher. And he brought the message of Christ to a baseball player named Billy Sunday, a baseball player. Sunday held a revival in Charlotte, North Carolina. And in that revival meeting, it was so successful that it it got the attention of Mordecai Ham. Mordecai Ham was an evangelist at the time. Mordecai Ham was invited to come out and speak at these revival meetings that this baseball player, Billy Sunday, had put together. And then under Ham's preaching, a teenager by the name of Billy Graham gave his life to Jesus Christ. See, it all started with one man who said that a child was important. One man who spent hours of his time going into the streets of Chicago to preach to the children who were homeless. The children who were out and about and had no place to go, no place to be, nothing to do. So they wandered the streets. A child that was disengaged, hurting in need. It all started with a child. Now stop and think about this. How many people have D.L. Moody, F.B. Meyer, J.W. Chapman, Mordecai Ham, Billy Sunday, Billy Graham. How many people have come to know Jesus Christ because of these men's ministries? Oh my gosh, we're not going to see the results. We're not going to see the impact until we stand in heaven and God is doing the final accounting. When you come up to somebody, somebody else will come up to you that you would never have met ever in your life. They say, thank you for your faithful service because you came and you shared. Just this week, a great general in the faith, Reinhard Bonnke, an evangelist who preached to millions, passed away. But do you know that he came to faith 
Because a missionary was faithful, was wandering through a village in Germany. It was late at night and he could hear as he came into this village the groanings and the pains of a person who was afflicted, was crying out. Turns out that that person was a relative, a, uh, an ancestor of Reinhard Bonnke who had a disease that was so terrible. I don't, I don't remember what the disease was, but this person was in such pain that he would groan and cry out in his house and the whole village could hear it. So this missionary asks, what is that noise? I got to do something about it. He went into that family. He went into that person's house and he started sharing the faith. That family received him and opened up their doors. He shared the faith. He shared the gospel. And Reinhardt's family accepted Jesus Christ. Think about that. A person who says, I have to give of myself. I have to follow the example that's set before me by Jesus Christ. I have to because true love shares the gospel. I have to speak the words of life. And how many people have come to faith because of Reinhard Bonnke's life? How many preachers and evangelists have come to faith? You know what? I'm not a Reinhard Bonnke. If Jesus has me one day speak before multitudes, praise God, glory to him. But you know what? I'll take the one that he gives me. And I'll say, Lord God, I'm going to share the faith. I'm going to share the gospel with the person you put in front of me. I'll be faithful with your message with the few. Not caring if you will ever put me before the many. And that's the, that's the core of the message. That's the love that Christmas brings. When Jesus came, we celebrated his arrival. The Magi celebrated. The shepherds celebrated. Everybody celebrated. But why did he come? He came to a world that was bitten by sin and the wages of sin is death and we are all in desperate need of him. Therefore, in an act of love, God sent his son to die. Not only for Israel, not only for the chosen, not only for his elect, but for all of those who would hear his calling and respond to him by faith. How is a person born from above? It's very simple. How is he or she saved from eternal perishing? It's very simple. It's by believing in Jesus Christ, by looking to him in faith. The difference between perishing and living and between condemnation and salvation is faith in Jesus. It's the faith of Jesus in operation in our lives. Jesus could have as well have come, stop and think about this, as a judge, he could have come and condemned every single person. You're not enough. No, but he came as a savior. And then he gave of himself. And he poured of himself into us. And then he says, you are enough now because my spirit abides in you. Now go and share what you have received. Amen. So let's stand together this morning. And I want every eye here to close, every head to bow. And I just want to give an opportunity at this moment. If there's anybody here that this is the first time you're hearing about this love that arrived, a God who loved us so much to leave heaven and come to earth, subject himself to pain, to suffering, so that I could have a relationship with, his, with the Father. If that's you, it's the first time you hear this message. And you say, I have things in my life that are not right. I have sinned. I have fallen short. I am living that scripture that I'm living in death. I know what's reserved for me because I am not good in and of myself. If that's you today, I want you to raise your hand because there's hope and I want to pray with you. If you want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior for the very first time today, I want you to just raise your hand. I'm going to pray for you. I'm not going to, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. I just want to include you in my prayer. If there's anybody here today, your life matters to Jesus. He's got a plan and a purpose for you that is beautiful, that is right. God bless you, man. He is good. He is worthy. If there's anybody here that says, I need to reconnect my life to God. I need to rededicate myself to him because I have strayed and I have gone far off. You can raise your hand too. Blessings. God bless you. God bless you. Father, in your mighty name. I thank you for these lives. I thank you, Lord God, for the faith that's being placed on you. 
you gave the ultimate price. You paid it, Lord God, with a willing heart. Your attitude says, it's worthy of me to do this. It's right for me to do this because I do it for you, God. And by your actions, you bought us life. Father, I pray for these lives who have lifted their hands and I ask you, Jesus, today is the day of salvation. Father, today is a day that all things are new. Today is a day that you are stripping away every sin, every worry, every single disappointment, every habit, Lord God, that is wrong. You are today equipping and empowering your children to live by faith and to trust in you. I declare that the old is gone and the new has come. In your mighty name. Today, Lord God, I ask you that you would replace those desires. That, Father, you would work in hearts that we would not choose the things of the world, but choose you, Lord God, first and foremost. And, God, that we'll trust in you to add to us all the things that we need for your faith. Father, in your mighty name, receive these ones by faith and give us hope in your great arrival. Prepare us, Lord God, for your return. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen and amen.